The initial words exchanged between Adam and Eve in Book 4 of Paradise Lost, though fitting as an introduction to Adam, seem somewhat out of place in the setting Milton presents. As Adam and Eve enjoy a serene scene by a fresh fountain, surrounded by the beauty of Eden, partaking in a supper of nectarine fruits, and engaging in affectionate moments, Adam delivers a profound sermon praising God's goodness. This spiritual discourse contrasts with the idyllic atmosphere, leaving Eve, though humble and pious in her response, longing for a simpler conversation. The peaceful, pastoral setting and Adam's proximity evoke a nostalgic mood in Eve, leading her into a sentimental reverie. She reflects on her first conscious moments on Earth, describing the day she awoke under a shade, wondering about her existence. Despite Eve's active and inquisitive mind, her lyrical description, with its unhurried pace and elongated vowels, conveys a sense of languor and drowsy perplexity. Her attention is drawn to the nearby water, its murmuring sound captivating her senses. Approaching the water's edge, Eve gazes into the clear smooth water, mistaking its reflection for another sky. The phrase with inexperienced thought suggests Eve is not fully awake, perhaps not yet morally responsible. Her initial actions stem from sensory stimulation rather than reason, highlighting a quality of her character crucial to the unfolding events. As Eve peers into the water, she startles at her own reflected image. Despite briefly backing away, she is pleased by the fair face she sees and looks again, met with answering looks of sympathy and love. Enchanted by this vision, Eve risks falling into the perilous enchantment of self-love, akin to Narcissus. However, the voice of God intervenes, redirecting her attention and offering companionship. God acknowledges Eve's beauty and love for beauty, promising her a place where no shadows stay and where she can enjoy inseparable union with Adam. Eve, perceiving Adam as less amiable than her water-reflected image, momentarily desires to return to the pond. Her sensitivity to beauty and preference for her mirrored self over Adam's image reveal an aspect of her character pivotal to the narrative. Adam, deeply in love, pursues Eve when she flees, passionately expressing his longing for her companionship. Eve, moved by Adam's plea, stops running, and they share a tender moment. In her reflections, Eve realizes the superiority of manly grace and wisdom over mere beauty. While this passage may initially seem like a psychologically accurate portrayal of Eve's first moments, it also subtly hints at seeds of discord leading to the fall. Eve's susceptibility to sensory beauty, her brief enchantment with her reflection, and the contrast between her reactions to Adam and the water reflect deeper themes of vulnerability and the impending challenges to reason and order. Eve's sudden humility at the end may be influenced by flattery, but it serves as a nod to Milton's doctrine that wisdom surpasses sensuous beauty. Despite the apparent innocence of Eve's musings, Milton cleverly weaves in elements that foreshadow the conflicts and choices that will shape the narrative. Hence, Adam's intense passion for Eve tends to cloud his reason. Raphael expresses shock at Adam's disclosure, but readers should not be surprised, as Milton foreshadows this through Adam's words to Eve in Book 4, hinting at an emerging fondness bordering on excessive attachment. A pattern is established in the accounts of the characters' first moments, illustrating their prevailing attitudes throughout the poem. 
Adam, upon awakening, immediately engages in reasoning to identify his maker, showcasing pious enlightenment. In contrast, Eve, while contemplating her origin, succumbs to the appealing murmur of a nearby stream, revealing a tendency to prioritize sensory experiences over reason. Satan's initial actions emphasize the fatal pride and hate that distort his reason throughout his struggle against good. God, recognizing Adam's positive desire for enlightened obedience, appears majestically to instruct and guide him. However, with Eve, God refrains from reasoning directly, leaving that task to Adam, perhaps due to her potential incapacity to grasp lofty discourse. Milton subtly suggests, through Eve's awakening, that her innocent self-love, while not yet endorsed by free will, poses a potential flaw, making her vulnerable to Satan's later attacks. Despite her apparent innocence, Eve's vanity and inclination toward credulity hint at her susceptibility to moral challenges. Satan capitalizes on Eve's vanity and love of flattery during his trial temptation. In a dream, he allures her with sensuous imagery of the night, recognizing her sensitivity to natural beauty. Presenting himself as an angel, Satan tempts Eve with the forbidden fruit, exploiting her incipient vanity and credulity. Though only a dream, Eve succumbing to the trial temptation marks a small but definite deviation from the divine order. Satan has proven her susceptibility to corruption, foreshadowing the larger narrative of temptation and fall. Eve finds solace in Adam's assurances that imagination can often mimic reason without causing real harm. He comforts her with the notion that as long as the unapproved evil in the mind remains unacted upon, it doesn't constitute sin. However, the undeniable truth lingers, she has envisioned herself as a goddess admired by all of heaven. This marks a clear step away from her initial loving submissiveness to Adam, veering toward the infatuation with her own image that characterized her early experiences. This scene provides insight into Eve's actions on the morning of the fall. She has demonstrated her vulnerability and revealed herself as fallible, vain, and susceptible to appearances. Satan, having observed her flaws and desires, will undoubtedly exploit them. Despite being obedient in her early state, she is now drawn to her own vanity, setting the stage for the impending events. As Adam points out, the separation of duties is essential. Eve's proposed independence disrupts the natural order and her intended role as caretaker of Eden and companion to Adam. Adam pleads with her to abandon her plan, emphasizing the importance of obedience over unnecessary temptation. Eve, in response, portrays herself as a victim of Adam's lack of confidence in her capabilities, cleverly arguing against his resistance. Although her argument appears clever, Adam counters by highlighting the fallibility of reason and the potential for deception. Adam's warning against unnecessary temptation is solid, but he falters when expressing hope that, having been warned, Eve will resist temptation. This weakness stems from his earlier uxoriousness, allowing emotion to compromise reason. Eve shifts the blame onto Adam, and with cunning shrewdness, she severs herself from him, marking a conscious approval of her innate vanity and resistance to guidance. Satan, seizing the opportunity, employs an elaborate flattery campaign, emphasizing Eve's divine qualities and the adoration she deserves. His artful manipulation, targeting Eve's vulnerability and ambition, aims to coax her into disobedience. Satan's argument in the dream temptation still echoes, 
questioning how the acquisition of knowledge, represented by tasting the forbidden fruit, could be harmful. He draws a parallel by suggesting that, just like a beast tasting the fruit, Eve, too, should partake and become godlike. This assertion aligns with Adam's fear that the tempter seeks an easy entrance, and Satan is keen on demonstrating that Eve willingly chooses her path, implying that the disobedience of God's order needs rationalization. In the rationalization of her actions, Eve acknowledges that Earth feels the wound, hinting at the consequences of her disobedience. This admission, coupled with her inclination toward mature sins, raises suspicions. Satan exploits the possibility that his passion may be perceived as better knowledge, deceiving Eve into thinking that her disobedience is a willful assertion of independence. In partaking of the fruit, Satan, with confident charm, consumes Eve's innocence. Her transgression is not only one of self-approval but also a triumph of passion over reason. Eve's weak reason succumbs to Satan's influence, as her love for herself surpasses her allegiance to Adam. Adam's love for Eve has, in essence, led him to worship her instead of fulfilling his role as her hierarchical superior. The rule dictates that eating the fruit brings death, a fact known to Adam. However, he willingly accepts this fate, seeking retribution from the woman who had corrupted his reason. This intertwining of passion and reason sets the stage for the conflict within Paradise Lost and reveals Milton's intricate portrayal of Adam and Eve's inherent nobility despite their impending fall. The challenge lies in reconciling their nobler aspects with their susceptibility to temptation, a conflict that has intrigued critics throughout the ages. Milton, Millicent Bell argues, foresaw the dramatic climax and felt the need to present the threshold moment leading to the fall, necessitating a subtle approach to preserve the authenticity of Adam and Eve's innocence. The predominant weaknesses leading to their undoing are hinted at without forcing them across the line between innocence and sin prematurely. Although this device is not always flawless, such as in Eve's morning departure from Adam, Milton Adept uses dramatic foreshadowing in passages like the Pond Passage in Book 4 to subtly convey the embryonic stages of the fall of man beneath the charming surface of Adam and Eve's idol.